everybody. Really warm welcome to St. Mary Lebeau Church tonight for tonight's Just Share evening. Thank you to Reverend George Bush, Rector here for hosting tonight's event. I'm uh, Reverend Catherine Headley. I'm Vicar of All Hallows by the Tower and just recently come into the city. Um, so delighted to be with you here this evening. Tonight's event is organised by Just Share, together with the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility, Church Action on Tax Justice, and the London Church's Social Action. Uh, many of you know Just Share is a coalition of churches and charities which seek to engage with the City of London and beyond on issues of global and economic injustice. And tonight we're really picking up on one of those themes, and our theme for tonight is Tax for the Common Good. But wonderful speakers tonight, Anne Fairpo, Father Simon Cuff, and David Haslam, and I'll introduce them each as they come through and speak to you. Um, not many of us like to pay tax, but it's through our tax that we can create the kind of society and environment we want to live in. And so tonight we have, through our speakers, the chance to explore that relationship between tax law and ethics, about a tax uh, system that's fair, efficient, and transparent, and what the Christian tradition says about the common good and what can be expected from individuals and businesses about their tax uh, policy. So the format for this evening will be that in a moment I will ask each speaker to come forward and give their opening presentations for about 10, 12 minutes. Uh, and then after that, we'll have about uh, 15 minutes or so for Q&A, so do be thinking as they speak about the things you'd like to bring up, uh, perhaps a comment or any question that you have. Uh, and then after the Q&A, we'll have some closing remarks from our speakers. Uh, and then afterwards, we have the opportunity to continue the discussion uh, with our speakers over a glass of wine, uh, a seminar over in the vestry next door. So you're all invited to come and share with that. But it's wonderful to have you all here tonight, and I'm sure we will uh, learn a lot and uh, share together on this really important uh, issue. So I'd like to um, welcome our first speaker, Anne Fairpo. Anne is a senior tax lawyer from Temple Tax Chambers, who subst has substantial and diverse experience of tax matters, gained both within the law and accounting practices. She was called to the bar in 2009 after 15 years as a solicitor, and her experience and expertise covers UK and international corporate tax planning and dispute. Anne has acted for a range of clients, from small owner-managed businesses to listed multinationals. She also has a particular interest in intellectual property taxation and UK-US cross-border tax planning with regard to both direct and indirect tax matters. Anne is a past president of the Chartered Institute of Taxation. She also tells me she teaches ethics and taxation at Oxford and has a theology degree. So, uh, thank you, Anne. I should start by saying that what I'm going to say today are my views. They are not the views of the Bar Council necessarily. I hope they wouldn't disagree with me. Um, but specifically, I'm not here representing any particular body. I am representing myself only, just, just to be clear on that one. Um, now, I have the possibly slightly unenviable position of opening this from the point of view of the lawyer. But I think in general terms, if you're looking at the question of tax and the common good and how the two interrelate with the law, the lawyers are not necessarily as far away from um, those within the church, as you may think. Um, the key, I think, that comes out of this is, firstly, we need to define what it is the common good is for these purposes. It's talked about in the sort of question of you should pay to contribute to society and, um, and so on. But one of the links that, to me, feels has been lost over time, over decades, I think, as tax law has developed, and this is not just in the UK, I think this happens, uh, has happened over the past few decades, possibly the past few centuries, uh, in quite a few countries, which is that we have lost sight of why we are taxing, what tax is for. There is this perception that tax is something that is extracted from people by the government, and it's something that's taken away, that you were never, you know, you, you've been robbed somehow. Um, and that is something that in many jurisdictions is actually 
uh, not helped by the way that tax law is made. Tax law is made in many cases very haphazardly. There isn't a central policy approach. Um, there is not necessarily particular coherence in tax law. And that makes it much more difficult for people, I think, to understand what the responsibilities are, why things are the way they are, and how they are supposed to react. I'll, I'll give you one UK example, but there are many examples from many countries. This isn't simply the UK. Um, if you are a partnership, you're in business in a partnership, say there are three of you, you're not related in any way, shape, or form, and the partnership owns a piece of property, and for whatever reason, you decide to sell that piece of property. Um, in general terms, provide, well, sorry, not sell the property, to transfer the property to the partners. Now, the way partnership law works is if it's a normal partnership, you're treated as already owning the property. As partners, if you transfer it to the partners in their own right, in the same shares, there's been no change in beneficial ownership. Your, the benefit you derive from that property hasn't changed. So there's no capital gains tax charge, generally speaking. This isn't, by the way, tax advice. This is an example. However, under UK law, in those circumstances, there will be a charge to stamp duty land tax which gives you an immediate question of what is the purpose of the policy of either of those taxes? Why do you get no tax for capital gains purposes, but you do get a tax for stamp duty land tax purposes? Um, and it's those inconsistencies that give rise to many problems within tax law. And from the point of view of looking at tax and the common good from the legal perspective, my starting point, I think, would be to encourage um, a move towards understanding, tax, you know, getting coherent, consistent tax policy from governments. Why is tax imposed the way it is? What is the purpose? What is it intended to do? And to have a coherent theme, not just, a, well, we need to raise a bit of money for this, or we don't like that. Now, tax can be used for purposes of encouraging behavior, as well as discouraging behavior, and raising funds for government in general, but we need to be clear about why things are happening and what's happening. And for that policy that underwrites or should underwrite the law to be clear in that context and to make it clear why things are happening and how they're happening. Because if you don't do that, how can you understand what your tax obligations are? Um, and if a, a taxpayer, and this doesn't matter whether you're an individual or whether you're a company, if you don't understand why you're being taxed the way you're taxed, and if you don't understand how the law is intended to operate and the purpose of it, it becomes more difficult to comply. A lot of my work is with clients that are looking to be compliant, but they simply don't understand what it is they are required to do. Uh, partly that's the sheer complexity of UK tax law, unfortunately. We, we, the, the UK approach to tax seems to be, let's add a bit more legislation on, rather than properly actually clarifying what is there and working out how it's supposed to work and to take it through from that. Um, and I think any society that intends to operate fairly and constructively needs a legal system that is fair and constructive and that can be easily followed, or at least can be followed preferably easily. Uh, in, in this sort of context. I don't think you can really talk about fairness between taxpayers until there is a fair system for taxpayers to actually operate within. Uh, or you can certainly talk about fairness between taxpayers, but it's much harder to do so if the tax system that they are operating within is not itself clearly fair. That extends internationally as well. Um, and it remains the case that, in my view at least, I think governments need to consider not only the, their own tax systems, but the tax systems of the countries that they operate with. Now, the economy we have globally is one of competition. Every country competes with every other country uh, to operate in many ways. Um, and one of the elements that remains, of, I would say, of concern is whether there is sufficient support between governments to actually support countries that may need more assistance um, with their tax laws and approaches to tax laws. There are massive inefficiencies in many, most tax jurisdictions, the UK included in this sort of context. Um, they are exacerbated, I think, in jurisdictions that have less um, 
legal support for enforcing the rule of law in their country. And that is something where I think there should be more coordination at the government end, and it's an aspect of law. But back to what you need is a legal framework that people understand that is clear, and then an interaction between different legal frameworks that is also clear and support between governments for themselves. I mean, I'll leave you with one particular thought. It's just looking at my time and the times we have available. Um, as an example of, I would say, government responsibility for tax systems and getting things correct, one of the areas that is looked at quite regularly as an example of places with tax havens remains the Caribbean. Um, the reason the Caribbean is, is favoured, if you like, in certain circumstances, is because the UK government left the Caribbean in the 1940s, 1950s, and in order to minimise the UK support needed for those jurisdictions, set up effectively a financial services sector as being the main source or a principal source of income for those sectors. And it remains that point of effectively there is a, a construct that has enabled certain um, arrangements to be made to allow certain countries to support themselves. And if you take that away, what's left for the population of those countries to support themselves? I'm not saying it's right and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that in this context, there is a wider societal point of what do you do to support populations where at the moment the principal income of those countries perhaps may be franchise fees from companies that are set up there. It's a point to think about. I'm not saying don't, don't do anything about it. But it remains that point that the legal system it needs to be a wider, coherent legal system, um, potentially more global than it currently is. Thank you, Anne. Our next speaker is five, Father Simon Cuff. Father Simon is a tutor and lecturer in theology at St. Melitus College. He studied philosophy and theology and Jewish studies at Oxford University and has a keen interest in Catholic teaching, sacramental theology and evangelism, and the use of scripture in systematic theology and political thought. Following ordination, Father Simon served his curacy and was then interim priest in charge of a busy parish in Ealing Broadway. Father Simon has a long association with the craft of community organising through Citizens UK and as a fellow of the Centre for, the, for Theology and Community. And through this, he participated in the Living Wage campaign and alongside migrants and refugees through the work with Migrants Organise and Safe Passage. Father Simon has a passion for social justice in every area of life and has recently joined the board of the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility. Please welcome Simon. Uh, good evening. Um, the uh, talk I'm about to give has uh, an accompanying set of slides. Uh, if it would be useful, they're on the Just Share website. Um, for if you want to look at them afterwards, that's justshare.org.uk. If you um, don't have access to the internet, there are a few copies at the back, but um, uh, there's more for reference afterwards than uh, for now. Um, I want to do a couple of things in, in the 10 minutes I've got. The first is to look at taxation in the Old Testament, then to look at taxation in the New Testament, and then to look at taxation in the body of teaching that comes out of the Roman Catholic Church sometimes called Catholic social teaching, which seeks to ask, what does it mean for a Christian to act in the world? Um, but, but before I begin that, I want to start by recognizing that for any Christian that wants to build a movement of people who want to have a fair system of taxation, we need to start by recognizing that very few of us enjoy paying tax. When we get our pay slips and we see how much tax has gone out of the pay slips, most of us don't greet that with joy, even if we are of the, the, the perspective that we should be paying lots of tax. Most people find tax difficult. The reason why the phrase death and taxes are the only two things you can guarantee rings true is because they're both things we tend to want to avoid. We want the philosopher's stone to help us to avoid death, and we want a nice offshore account to help us avoid tax. Um, the other thing I want us to, to take as a starting point is that Taxation is much more about just what leaves your wallet. T 
taxation in the Christian tradition and in the Jewish tradition is about identity, the kind of people we are. Um, and some, that sense of identity is reflected in the tax uh, and the common good brochures that uh, church acts and towards, uh, cha for tax justice have produced, which are in the seats. Um, that document says that the conversation about our tax system is not just a matter for tax experts, it is for all of us. Decisions about taxation cut to the heart of our beliefs about the type of society we want to live in and how to live out our faith in that world. When we turn to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, we find three different examples of taxation. The first is the temple tax, which was paid by all adult males um, and was a half shekel. It was a token amount to show your identity, to show that you were a member of the Jewish race. Women and children could pay it if they wanted to, and certain people were forbidden from paying it, Gentiles and Samaritans. So the temple tax was a way of showing that you were a member of the Jewish people. It's a statement of identity. The second kind of tax we find in the Old Testament is agricultural tithing. You give 10% uh, of your produce um, to the poor. Um, and this system of taxation links how much tax you pay to how much you produce and it's geographically circumscribed. You pay that tithe to the poor in your land. It's a flat rate. You don't pay it every year, you pay it every third year, and it goes to certain religious figures first, and then to the poor, the widden, widow, and the orphan. This isn't a progressive tax system, but it is distributive. It, it prioritizes the poor and those religious leaders who otherwise wouldn't get paid. The third kind of tax we have coming out of the Old Testament uh, is slightly later, and it's the Jewish notion of charity. So in rabbinic literature, um, we get this notion of charity stemming from a reading of Deuteronomy that says um, the poor need to be prioritized, and everyone should give a certain amount of their income towards protecting the poor. Uh, it, if you're not poor yourself, it's basically 10%. And if you're wealthy, it's 20%. But it shouldn't be above 20% because, um, and the Talmud warns, if you're too generous, you might end up poor yourself and you might end up um, being a uh, someone who has to rely on others' taxation. So it, it is slightly progressive in that there are these two bands, but there is an upper limit of how much tax you will pay. It's also voluntary. So it's not like a modern system of taxation and it's compulsory. It's a system of charity and benevolence. If we uh, look at what uh, comes out of these systems of tax in the Old Testament, um, we see that it's about identity. You pay your tax because that's the kind of person you are. It's linked to where you are based, where you are living, the society in which you're participating, and its primary object is for the alleviation of poverty. If we turn to the New Testament, we have a couple of passages where Jesus deals with the subject of taxation. Most famously, the uh, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render unto God that which is God's. There's lots of debate about this passage because um, the passage doesn't make a great deal of sense in Jesus' day, and some scholars think it's an oblique reference to the temple tax that the Jews were forced to pay by the Romans after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Again, this tax is about identity. Are you go, going to identify yourself with the Jewish people? A question which becomes very hot in the early church because um, as the Christians break away from the synagogue and the temple, the question is of how Jewish are they becomes a, a live question. And so Jesus seems to be saying, we are still part of the people of Israel, uh, pay your temple tax. Um, the final example I wanted to give was of taxation within uh, Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching develops in, uh, out of the Roman Catholic Church uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, and taxation really only becomes a matter of interest in Catholic social teaching at the second half of the 20th century. And we can observe a few uh, features of how the Roman Catholic Church teaches taxation policies should be set. The first is that it's for the alleviation of poverty between people and between nations. So taxation should alleviate disparities. 
Taxation should be fair, so you shouldn't burden the poor with too many taxes. Um, and across the 20th century, there are increasing calls from uh, uh, Catholic social teaching that taxation should be progressive. The wealthy can afford more, so they should pay more, and the poor who benefit from tax receipts should pay less. And the document which deals most in detail with um, this theology of taxation is a document written by uh, the American Catholic bishops um, uh, called Economic Justice for All, where they say that first, the tax system should raise adequate revenues to pay for public needs, secondly, it should be progressive, and third, those who are least able to pay should pay no income tax at all. Above all in Catholic social teaching, taxation is an instrument of solidarity, an instrument which helps us relate to our brothers and sisters. Um, trying to draw these threads together, I think we can outline what are the seeds of a, a Christian notion of taxation, namely that tax shows the world the kind of people that we are, tax is linked to place, we pay taxes where we live and where we reside, and the society we want to participate in and benefit from, and tax above all is for the alleviation of poverty on, uh, in the first instance, and then disparity between people um, and divisions and inequalities that rise up because of the disparity of wealth. There isn't a direct line to modern systems of taxation in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in Catholic social teaching, but we can see the seeds of the um, ideology behind uh, the world of tax that we now live in. Thank you. Our third speaker this evening is David Haslam. David is a Methodist minister, retired Methodist minister, who has worked in three UK cities and has been an executive committee member of the anti-apartheid movement and vice chair of War on Want. He was a founder of End Loans to South Africa, Transnationals Information Exchange, the Dalit Solidarity Network and Methodist Tax Justice Network, and Secretary of the Church's Commission for Racial Justice from 1987 to 1998. David was awarded an MBE for services to community relations. And David is chair of the recently launched, you have the, the booklet there, Church Action on Tax Justice. Very warm welcome to David. Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm uh, grateful to be here for, for two reasons, really. One is to be reconnected with, with Just Share. Um, being, I think, one of the, the, the founder members some 25 years ago or, or more, um, when, when Just Share came together as an ecumenical group to address um, economic justice in the context of, of the city. Um, and we were then adopted by St. Mary Le Beau, and so it's good to be back here after quite a long period of well, nearly 12 years in so-called retirement in, in Worcestershire. Um, and in those days, of course, when uh, Just Share first came to St. Mary Le Beau, we had the two um, uh, pulpits here, and there were debates between speakers from different perspectives, um, either lunchtime or early evening like this. Um, and that was a, a lively time to be around. So good to know that Just Share um, is still alive and that um, St. Mary is still hosting it. Second reason I'm grateful is because yesterday when I went into hospital in Worcester for a, um, a routine scan, I was told... Um, oh dear, I think you need to stay here. Um, um, we need to do something to you. Um, but after about five hours, there weren't any beds. Um, uh, so uh, they let me go home and I said, well, I'm going to London tomorrow, call me on Thursday. Um, and uh, the NHS, um, our great NHS, supported by our taxation, of course, doesn't have enough beds. Um, and that's another reason why this issue is a particularly important one. But I'm grateful for the organizers, organizers in their flexibility of allowing me not to speak and then allowing me to speak again. Um, and also to my colleague, Bishop Michael, who stepped up and then stepped back again because I was able to, to be here. But I want to just take you first to um, uh, 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 an event that I participated in in, in Durban in, in South Africa just two or three weeks ago, which was called together by the World Council of Churches and other 
um, uh, collective bodies to, to talk about tax justice and reparations as part of their um, process of trying to put together what the churches together and internationally should be saying um, on this topic. And um, reparations, my colleagues from Europe weren't too sure about that. What, what does reparation, we know what tax justice means, but what, what does reparations really mean? But in that context of only 25 or so people, um, but from 16 or 17 different countries, and there were four of us from Europe and one from North America, but she was a black church leader and therefore I think understood their perspective as well as ours. And to be in that perspective of people primarily from uh, Africa, from Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, um, the Pacific, talking about tax justice and reparations, the world looks very different, believe you me, from our privileged um, and uh, position in this country of economic power um, over against the situation which people in, in those, those countries face. And I was reminded again how exploitative our global economic system is and how much we continue to benefit from it, we in the West. We may think we're struggling and of course we have poverty, um, but we also um, are, have an extremely privileged and secure existence compared to the people who were talking to us. And they were talking to us both in economic terms and ecological terms of the need for reparation um, to be made for the, the damage that's been done to their economies and to their, um, their, their ecology also. Um, uh, for them, the current economic system is broken. Um, and that, that was uh, exemplified for me no more clearly than in conversation with the former General Secretary of the uh, uh, United Church of, of Zambia, or the Council of Churches of Zambia, in fact, uh, Reverend Suzanne uh, Metali, who said, you know, when I look at what's happened in my country of Zambia in terms of the, the copper trade, which has been so lucrative for um, some of your uh, mining enterprises and indeed your pension funds in the West, um, the way that it's distorted our economy, the lack of knowledge we have even about how much copper you're taking out of our country, how much profit you're making, um, the, the corruption that's been uh, engendered because of the disparity uh, of, of wealth of, of, of people involved in, in, in the copper mining and those who aren't. We'd have been better if probably you had never come, the mining companies had never come to our countries. And when you really think about the repercussions of that and spread it around the world to the different um, countries where we're currently mining and not looking after our um, uh, waste materials properly, as, as we know, um, that, that, that is, was quite a staggering thought to me and let it remain, it's going to remain with me for, for quite a long time. Um, and so the uh, implications of that are that we have um, a, a debt to pay, and it's an economic debt, but it's also an ecological debt because of what is, what is left. And, and one of the other thoughts that came out of that, um, that gathering, that consultation, was um, uh, how do we address this question of a wealth tax, which is a, another of those topics that's, that's uh, broadly on the tax justice scene at the moment. Uh, and, and what we emerged with in, in that Christian context is the idea of a, a Zacchaeus tax. Uh, a Zacchaeus tax which would be 1% from the 1% for the 50%. So that every year the wealthy, that wealthiest 1%, pay over 1% of their wealth um, and for the benefit of the 50%. And people say, well, that's going to be a very difficult thing to organize. Of course it is, but if you don't have principles and aims, then you, you're not going to get there. And that was an idea which kind of felt good to the people from the South and indeed the people from the North of how you might begin to equalize this vastly um, uh, imbalanced world trade and, and, and economic system. Um, and, and associated with that was, yeah, and alongside that from the corporations, 25% from the 25%. 
So the wealthiest and largest 25% of corporations should be paying 25% corporation tax in the countries where they make their money and not in the countries where there is the lowest taxation in which they operate. Um, and in the South African context, a very clear um, example was giving to, given to us about the Lonmin company, um, which is the, the company that mines primarily in South Africa but also other places, um, and where 43, sorry, 34 miners were, were shot dead um, four or five years ago for demonstrating for higher wages, um, which they would have been entitled to so the research uh, showed, if Lonmin hadn't been shifting their profits through Bermuda into other places. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to the, the Caribbean uh, in a moment, just briefly. But um, the, um, the, the final point I think is worth meditating on that came from um, that, that particular gathering was the talk about ethical investment. Um, and we talk easily about ethical investment and um, uh, most of the churches are committing themselves to ethical investment. Um, but what they're failing to do, I think, in that context is to hear from the people who are primarily affected, affected by um, our, uh, our so-called ethical investment and the, the whole mining and extractive industries are perhaps a key element of that because of course of the Zambian situation and others that were, that were brought to our attention. And it seems to me there's a further step on this road which is called Christian investment. And Christian investment uh, makes absolutely sure that it engages with the people who are most affected um, by our um, investments, wherever they are, uh, uh, whether it's in uh, ecological terms through fossil fuel companies or whether it's in um, the mining and extractive industries um, or whether it's just in the wages that are paid even in, in Western Europe that you listen to the people who are most affected by um, the investments that you have and you re make sure you replay that to the companies in which we invest. Um, because there's no continued participation for me in the world economic system without um, protest. And that protest needs to be informed and it needs to be informed by the people who are most affected. Just finally then to draw attention to the, the brochure which has been mentioned earlier, um, to the introduction which says we're trying to start a big conversation uh, about these issues. One of the issues that arises is of course of tax havens and that's been um, briefly mentioned by others, particularly in the Caribbean. And there was an interesting conversation with the representative from Jamaica at the conference I've just referred to about how you do seek to help develop an alternative economy for the so-called tax havens, um, the small islands which we've been responsible for and I'm pointed to that of setting them up. And so what are we now going to do to offer them a, a way out of um, the, the situation that they've, where they've become dependent on being the home to thousands of, 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 of companies in some cases, which don't exist there at all really, um, but, 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 but shift their profits there because there's no tax to be paid. So do take one of these, in fact, take a bunch of these away, spread them, share them with other people in your churches or communities, um, help us start the conversation about how to create a better tax system for the common good. Thank you. Thank you very much to Anne and to Father Simon and to David for those three very uh, helpful and interesting perspectives on this issue. Um, I found Anne's was very much sort of the big picture, um, you know, actually going back to what is tax for um, and how we create a fair system. Uh, Father Simon looking at scriptures and working through from that about identity and um, the, the, the ethics behind, the sort of theological ethics behind um, taxation. And then David looking at the perspective, who are you at, whose position are you speaking from? Which country, uh, those in positions um, where um, they actually need to have voice in order to speak into the system. 
and how to give them that voice. So do have a think about questions you'd like to ask, uh, any comments you'd like to make on anything that our speakers have said tonight or something that would uh, either to uh, someone in particular or a general question that they can, they can each answer. There'll be someone uh, with a microphone at the back there. So just have a moment uh, and just see if you have something you would like to ask. One at the front here. Thank you. Thanks. Can I ask about the mechanics of how you would actually organize a coherent tax system? Because I'm thinking that the revenue departments uh, are very much concerned with the actual collection of the tax, so the nitty gritty of does this man owe the tax or does he not? Whereas the Treasury is more concerned with either grand stimulating the economy or not, or can I raise the money in order to pay for universal credit or whatever it is? And you also have to be pretty senior before you can take it upon yourself to say, well, how would I design a tax system? Do I go for inheritance tax? Do I go for land tax or whatever? So how do you, in practice, do you foresee a design being implemented you know, within the civil service? Because they'd be the body they would have to actually do it. Should we start with Anne on that one? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I would actually start by asking the population what it is they expect. Sorry. Um, I think that's, it's, it's got a green light, so hopefully it's, <laughs> uh, I'll lean a bit closer, is that better? Right. Um, I would actually start by asking the population. Um, the difficulty of that obviously is having an informed discussion. I think the last few years have shown us that having an informed discussion is not the easiest thing. Um, but actually, I would start with what is it we want our society to support and to manage? Uh, it's not impossible. They've actually started to do this in Scotland. Since Scotland has um, had some tax uh, powers uh, devolved to it, there has actually been a discussion about what do the Scottish people want to spend their taxes on? Um, what is the point of their tax system? Because... Oh, the systems we've inherited, and we've inherited them over centuries, um, are very piecemeal. There is, as you say, there's no coherent, uh, the nearest thing we've got to any coherent system for tax is that it's here to, sp it's, it's to support the military. Um, I mean, if you actually go back through history, tax in most societies starts as a means for supporting war. But then the nation state as a concept, to a certain extent, started as a, me as a mechanism for um, enforcing uh, one's uh, one nation, one group of persons' opinions on somebody else, should we say, in that sort of context. Um, but I, I would start with a national conversation, if it is possible. I appreciate this is not an easy task, but I don't think at this point that simply saying to civil servants, design us a tax system that works without actually understanding what you want the tax system to be doing and what, you, what we as a society believe we should be paying for and how we should be paying for it. Um, I think that's our starting point, is, is what we want to spend it on and then work out where it comes from in that context. David or Father Simon, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I think one thing I didn't mention that where Catholic social teaching gets to, that the, the last time it's um, taxes raised in Catholic social teaching is Pope Benedict, where he calls for the hypothecation of taxes as a means of making tax more um, popular. There's some evidence from the states that if people are asked, do you want your tax to uh, be raised to pay for X, people are more likely to say yes. So careful use of, of hypothecation might be a way of uh, um, increasing uh, tax revenue Having said that, there are problems with popular referenda, as we have seen. Um, I mean, oh, ancient history actually shows us that you can do some of this. Um, for all the conversation about the fact that nobody likes paying tax, if you go back to certain periods in ancient Greece, um, people actually vied to pay tax because it was seen as the more you supported, the more you got out of the society. You got the benefit of the laws. You got the benefit of an educated workforce. You got all sorts of benefits. People did at one point, admittedly quite a long time ago, actually fight to pay more tax and to show off how much tax they paid. The showing off might have been a bit key on that one, by the way. 
Well, I'm really encouraged to, to hear that. That's a very good, good <laughs> message, because I, I was going to say, I mean, certainly Christians need to say, I love tax. I re- I, my, my badge I see is on my um, uh, uh, coat, but the, 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 the fair tax mark people have got their badge with a green heart and, um, put, and, and fair tax. Uh, and uh, the only time I've managed, I think, to silence a radio interviewer for several seconds uh, about, um, was about this issue was by saying, look, I really love paying tax because I know I'm making a contribution to a society in which is going to have schools and decent hospitals and social care uh, and decent roads and rubbish collection and all the other things that the services that we enjoy. Um, so I think that's a very important message for, for Christians to bang on about. Um, we ought to get fair, fair tax week comes in the first week of July, so that's a target for people to organize around uh, with Tax Justice Sunday as part of that on on the 7th of July. So I hope people will be um, bigging that up, as it were, and we'll provide you with the resources to get the conversation going that Anne spoke about and I spoke about to say, we really love tax and this is how we want it to work. Fantastic. Can we have another question? Over here. Thank you. I've got the microphone. Thanks. Um, I'd like to know, in a way, how we can encourage the public conversation that Anne was talking about in particular. The the things that occur to me as difficulties in that are the constant sort of anti-tax things you get in certain elements of the press. For example, just to take one well-known tax, inheritance tax, this seems to be regarded as some sort of um, evil by the likes of the Telegraph and the Mail and so on. And um, in terms of how successful they are in selling it as a terrible evil that will hit you and what you can buy, um, I can remember discussions with my elderly parents while they were still alive about inheritance tax. They were concerned about it. The total amount of their assets and wealth was such that they were nowhere near the possibility of paying any inheritance tax. They found this difficult to conceive. Um, So that was one thing. uh, Another example is that um, at some point in my career, I was fortunate enough to move from one job to another and to move onto a rate of pay where I started paying higher rate tax rather than basic, basic rate tax, the marginal point. And some people said to me, including people who were my earlier colleagues and who were paying basic rate tax at maximum height, oh, won't you have to pay higher rate tax? Won't that be a bad thing? So I said, well, hang on. The only reason I have to pay higher rate tax is because I'm lucky enough to be earning enough money to pay higher rate tax. And yet, that was the perception. It seems to me, I don't know how we tackle that kind of thinking which is clearly egged on by some of the press and, 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 and you know it is dishonest clearly because anybody who sort of raises those concerns when the concerns are false is, is a difficult issue. So h- how to change the negative perception of tax? Well I mean I think we've tried to partly answer yeah. that with the, with, the, with the previous question but the word that came into my mind that I didn't use was solidarity and I think um, you know, to get that uh, concept across that we want solidarity in society, we want a cohesive society, and goodness knows, um, if after the present debates about that, or the, the B word, um, we, we're really going to need that. And maybe that's one of the ways that we can get back to talking about something which perhaps is um, of more lasting importance, shall we say. And I do think the churches have got a role to play in that, and, and that we ought to be really upfront about it. And we'll try and as I said, provide you with the ammunition, as it were, for, for you to get going, um, in, firstly in your church communities and then in the wider society. Thank you. Another question at, at the back there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you could expand a bit on um, something of what you've been starting to address, which is citizenship, and what you think might be a distinctly Christian understanding of that, and therefore in light of taxation and thinking about contribution and how you are invested in in society as a citizen rather than a lot of our contemporary understandings of belonging which are very individualistic and so this gentleman's point about 
not wanting to pay something is about restricting what should be mine. So it's kind of libertarian in, in, in most of its thinking. Could you just say something about a distinctly Christian sense of citizenship and how that might uh, influence tax? Father Simon? Yeah. Um, I think uh, a couple of thoughts. I'm not sure that it's a very coherent answer to the question, but um, the first is that uh, a distinctively Christian notion of these things wouldn't be transactional. Um, uh, our economy, as, a, as Christians, we don't believe in you do something to get something. Um, whereas most people, why they, they don't favor paying taxes and uh, is the false notion that I don't get anything from this. I've never been sick, I don't go to the doctor, I don't have any children, why should I pay this? Um, and moving to a, a, a notion of the reason that you're paying tax is because you want to be part of this society that you enjoy and relish and want to flourish and, and that, that language of solidarity. I think a part of this is um, we live in a time when the, the levels of taxation for the very, very rich are historically very, very low. Um, and the post-war settlement about what was a reasonable amount of money for an individual to have uh, has broken down. So it's a Christian contribution to this debate might be to start questioning what seems to be taken as a given around the levels of taxation and start saying, well, actually, what, does, what is money for? Why do we have money? What, what, what's our wealth for? Um, to try and get out of that transactional economy into something which m might start looking a bit more Christian, um, I think. Thank you. Anything can, to add? I'll just go back to the Zacchaeus story because I think it's, it's a very rich story in, the, in this context. I mean, th th there was Zacchaeus, who was a Jew, but somehow he'd been co-opted by the occupying power to be, to be a tax collector. Um, but not only was he a tax collector, but he was a chief as well. He was taking more, um, and, and, and he could get away with it because he was, of course, protected by the, the Roman state, such as it was, uh, which, which allowed him to, to do that. Um, but he, he knows that this is wrong, um, and it's probably enhanced by his exclusion as a, an acceptable member of society. So he hears Jesus is coming, um, so maybe this is what my way out. I want to go and see this man, to listen to this man, to find out what the right kind of person to be is. Um, and when Jesus spots him, he knows he's an um, uh, 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 unacceptable element of that society, and he knows um, what, what he's going to get an earful. And when he turns around and says to, 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 to Zacchaeus, this unacceptable member of the Jewish community, come into your house, and I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to eat with you, the polluted person who deals with the, with the Roman authorities. And, and Zacchaeus' response is, you know, I'm, I'm going to give back four times over what I've cheated people out of. And Jesus' answer is salvation. Salvation's come to this house today. So if people want salvation, that's what um, we, we're going to have to challenge them and, and, and demand from them. So... I think repeating that story in our Christian context is, is one way, hopefully, to uh, get people to recognize what their responsibilities are, not just to be a Christian, but to be part of the human race. Thank you. Just, um, I think we've got time for one more question at the front here. Thank you. What do people think or can they give any examples of unfair taxes? Point, point the microphone at your mouth. Sorry, that's it. Can the team think of any examples of unfair taxes? It's quite difficult because the poll tax was fiendishly unpopular. But a lot of people said, oh, but it's fair because everybody pays their bit. Um, so do we think that's fair or unfair? Or is it unfair in the way it worked out? Another example might be in local government and the, the rating bans on, on houses. Um, and this seems to get very strange because, of course, they're all houses are always sort of going up and down in value. And this isn't quickly reflected in the rating system. Um, so, is so that unfair? Or? Fair and unfair taxes, and our response to that. 
as a Church of England clergyman, I've never paid council tax. I think that's pretty unfair. Um, <laughs> I, I, I suspect, I think all taxation systems as a human system are in some sense going to be fallible. Um, and so whatever system of banding you have, there'll be people around the edges of the bands who it might feel unfair. Um, and council tax, um, there's certainly disparities between access to services, uh, which could unfairly um, uh, prejudice poorer users of those services. Um, I don't think tax is the sort of halcyon pill. It's that constant working for something which is taxation is tran that transforms and liberates society rather than weighs it down, which is why the tax collectors in the Bible are, are, are figures of hate because they are extracting money from the poor. They're taking the tax from the wrong source. Um, so it's that, like any human system, there'll be weaknesses. I can give you an example of a tax relief that I think is unfair or an, um, an application, which is if you pay taxes and you make contributions to a pension, you get tax relief. The government contributes very nearly a quarter of what you contribute into your pension fund. If you earn too little to pay tax and yet you scrape together enough money to put it into a pension fund, you get no support from the government at all. And So if you pay a lot of tax, you get no tax relief on pensions at all, because right? they reduce it eventually. Probably don't need it. If you go, if you pay enough, eventually your tax, your pension relief, in fact, gets withdrawn again at the top end as well. I, yeah, there are some withdrawals there as well. Yeah. And you're certainly Can right about council tax. That's one of our targets that needs to be changed. It is a deeply unfair tax. Yep. The fact that even people on benefits have to pay 20% of the council tax is outrageous when you consider that people in the top most wealthy uh, accommodation um, pay com you know, comparatively little. Thank you for the questions tonight. Can I just ask our um, panelists today, um, just for one thought as we uh, wrap up this part of the evening and uh, move next door for our seminar and drinks to those who'd like to come, one thought for people to take away that... Um, will inspire them with their understanding and their paying of tax uh, and some, uh, something to encourage and inspire them? Well, I think it, it, it is that we need to say we love paying tax, but it's got to be a fair and just tax system. Um, and there are a number of things we can do. And they're all in the booklet. <laughs> Work on those. Thank you. It's fair and comprehensible which may involve some education as well. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that we are at a turning point in our country's history between whether we become more like America or more like Scandinavia, and tax is a big part of that conversation, and I know which way I would prefer to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, on your behalf, I would like to thank very much our uh, contributors tonight, uh, Anne Fairpo, Simon Cuff and David Haslam for their contributions and for their inspiration. I think we've all got a lot to take away uh, tonight to work on and a lot of encouragement actually. So thank you all very much. And yeah. <laughs> do take the booklet with you and do come next door and have a glass of wine with us. Thank you. And take some brochures. <laughs>